the other side of the tracks is a series of the hidden stories behind the release of a specific piece of audio production, unravelling the work, craft and decision making, and told by the creators themselves. In future, I may have things to say before and after the invited guest, but in this case, I'm very familiar with the work in question. And it is fitting, this guy kicks off the series with episode one. He needs no introduction, so I'll hand you straight over. Hey, someone has to step up for episode one, so it's me, Greg Barnett, your podcast host and first guest. Okay, let's first address the elephant in the room. I'm no expert or professional, so everything I say is only opinion based on personal experience. In this episode, I'll be providing some behind the scenes from the making of the Flat White album, released in 2020. This was my first solo venture, my second home studio production, and my third ever album release. And it has been my biggest project by Country Mile, an album containing 30 tracks. So, without doubt, it's my big one. My first ever batch of songs came to me at the ripe old age of 50, writing and co-writing with an old friend. We then found ourselves as wide-eyed babes in the wood, experiencing the many highs and lows of performing and recording that first album in a commercial studio. For example, we soon discovered that playing to a click track is not as easy as we had thought. Not All It Seems in 2002 was a fabulous new experience and a personal milestone, but still working at the time, the tight fixed three-day budget showed me that I could never ever fully bring my songs to life if I had to pay for a studio, let alone afford the luxury of session players or a producer. To do so, I'd have to accept the harsh reality of doing everything myself, maximizing my few musical and technical strengths and minimizing the many weaknesses. So the next album, titled Prescient in 2015, was another out of the blue album. Roughly 15 years after the first album, I was retired and in my mid-60s and had the time to develop it as a 100% home studio project. A friend and I each wrote and performed our own songs separately in our own homes. We shared our learning experiences of recording, mixing, production and mastering, all from scratch via YouTube tutorials. It was tough times, but a fun and rewarding challenge and made easier because we each only had to do half an album's worth. My musical itch needed scratching again a few years later. To keep the challenge fresh, I determined that whatever happened, it was going to be a completely solo project. But with no single performance skill to impress, I was going to have to provide a lot of variety. At least I was fortunate to have many decades of great sounding music embedded in my musical memory, providing a benchmark and inspiration to help nudge my own writing and production. This project became the Flat White Album, released in 2020, and I've cherry-picked some aspects of its creation and production in 12 short chapters. Chapter 1. The Writing Environment Writing for this album was always done 6 to 8 a.m., sitting at the kitchen table. It's quiet outside, and no one else is stirring in the house. The kitchen provides great acoustics, wood, glass, tile, and I'd noodle around and scribble ideas on paper. Plus bottomless cups of coffee, which of course made a huge mess until I started using cups which actually had bottoms. For me, words and chords and melody always intertwine. Each informs the other. I write things down that show promise, but if I can't construct at least two interesting and self-contained lines of music and lyrics, by the end of two hours, all the scribbles are binned. When no lyrics bubble up, but the music is good, it becomes an instrumental. Everything worthwhile stays on scribbled paper until I have a complete and structured song ready with the best tempo, the richest sound in chord set and a key and melody to suit my vocal range. I do a rough recording of voice and guitar on phone to help me remember the melody, feel and rhythm. Three things I can so easily forget, especially as I don't perform my songs in public. Only then do I type it up in MS Word. All songs were done this way before I embarked on the actual recording sessions using a DAW. I used Pro Tools, but only because it was recommended to me in 2008 
in a music shop before I knew any better. The DAW has always been the very last step for me because it still fills me with dread each and every time I fire it up. Chapter 2 The Home Studio Recording Environment I regard the DAW as both angel and devil. It is the only tool that allows the written song to come to full life. It promises you the world, but forces you to crawl over broken glass every inch of the way to get a result you're happy with. My first home studio album in 2015 had taught me a few valuable lessons about time management and how best to preserve one's sanity. I'd learned to use a standardized template that would suit any track I'd ever record within the arrangement universe for my genre. The template opens freshly populated with relevant and pre-configured plugins and the few MIDI instruments that I know sound good and work well in a mix. There's nothing worse than disappearing for hours down the rabbit hole of auditioning new sounds by the hundreds, and finally re-emerging empty-handed and deeply frustrated at the failure. My home studio is an ordinary 5 by 3 meter room in an ordinary house. Plaster walls, tiled floor, large window. No sound treatment at all. My mantra has always been, good enough is good enough. My condenser microphone picks up extraneous sounds like our two dogs licking or shaking themselves, or bird noises outside, and Australian birds are very loud. But I've rarely needed to re-record anything, as, surprisingly, such noises are often buried and unheard once mixed into the full arrangement. But if neighbours are mowing, felling trees or working on engines, I simply have to postpone recording and perhaps work on editing or mixing something. The two biggest problems with this room are, with the sun facing window, it gets really hot during the day in the Australian summer months of December, January and February. So in general, most of the recording was pre-planned to occur in autumn, winter and spring. The second problem was the constant fan noise on my Windows laptop. Even when cool, it is always picked up by my condenser mic. Currently, it's very easy to overcome with cheap AI plugins, but back then, if not disguised in the mix, it needed to be tamed using EQ and a noise filter. Chapter 3 The Process for a Typical Recording Session Remembering that the songs were written, fully formed, and ready to go, my plan of attack is usually as follows. Setting the tempo and meter and marking the timeline with song parts. Playing the click back. Recording a rough acoustic guitar and rough vocal throughout. That is, not sweating about mistakes. Choosing a drum kit and basic pattern to support the song's feel, as I find it's much easier to play guitar when there's real and expressive drums rather than robotic clicks. Muting the click track and then fully recording the guitar against that basic drum track. I'd restart the whole section or phrase if I make a mistake. I'll then edit the drum tracks so it reflects changes in and between song parts and usually create an overall build of intensity throughout. I then record the main vocal. Lastly, I play with the arrangement from my usual palette of options like harmonies, bass, strings, brass, synths and choir. Chapter 4 Making the Most of My Acoustic Guitar I've been playing 12-string guitar exclusively since I first played and fell in love with one at age 19. The sound is exquisite and subtly different from a 6-string because the four bottom string pairings have thinner octave strings. For example, one of my favourite chord shapes is the full-bodied E major with an add 9 on the 4th string. The result is that the top E string coexists with an F sharp and G sharp pitched above it. I'm a realist who's got increasingly cranky with consumerism, so I have only the one guitar, an electroacoustic Takamini. As the keystone instrument featured throughout the album, the overall sound needs to be, and these are not technical terms, full and large. My solution is to record the guitar via the condenser mic as well as the piezo pickup simultaneously, i.e. both open air and DI, direct inject. I EQ the two tracks differently and pan them across the stereo field. Here's 
here are five guitar considerations for me. I used a Dario EJ39 Phosphor Bronze Strings for feel and sound. Whenever I finger pick or strum, I play guitar slightly ahead of the beat and always accentuate the bass note. As a result of this, I rarely use electric bass guitar as it can complicate matters, muddying either the feel or the beat. This is the chord of E at concert pitch. But for the last 20 years, I've down-tuned my guitar to semitones. It suits the natural drop in my vocal range as I've aged. Also, with less string tension, the guitar is much easier to play and helps prevent the thin G string, the octave on the third string, from snapping. 12-string acoustics are twice as likely as a 6-string to go out of tune, and it's rare to get through many takes without having to tweak one or more strings. Playing with a plectrum gives a great attack, but sounds quite thin, the archetypal jangly 12-string. For example, here's James on track 18, the only use of plectrum on the entire album. I haven't used a plectrum or picks for 50 years. My own strumming is done with my nails. That's a harsher sound than my finger picking, for which I use the fleshy part of my fingertips. A much thicker sound. Chapter 5. Singing. Singing. <sighs> Whether real or imagined, singing has always been my Achilles heel. I've always maintained that the voice is the most important and impactful of all musical instruments, and is what people most respond to. I have a quite limited vocal range, and can only sing in a reserved and understated way, i.e. embarrassed. It lacks both power and emotion, and I cringe when listening to my own raw recordings. I therefore invited roughly 300 amateurs around the world who profess to love singing to take a lead role on this new album. Rather than being trampled in the rush, I received just three responses. Two were worse singers than me. The other was a stage voice without the intimacy I wanted for the songs. After three months searching, I gave up and committed to doing even the singing myself. Because it makes me uncomfortable, I do only two takes. I sing line by line or phrase by phrase and then comp the better parts of the two takes. Doing any more takes is just a waste of time and effort as it can never get better. And my voice, never strong in the first place, would soon give out. For me, as long as the vocal rhythm is good and the diction is clear, the pitch can be tuned manly if needs be. It is what it is. I get it done and move on. Chapter 6, My Best Buyers for the Studio My five best buys are not necessarily what people imagine. I've never played drums or been in a band, so my best buy by far was the Easy Drummer plug-in from Toontrack. Easy is the two letters E and Z. This allows me to quickly get great sounding drums and percussion to properly suit the vibe of each track and just let me get on and concentrate on everything else. The drum parts were fully formed, but I had the option of editing every single hit, which I really bothered doing. Simply dialing in changes to the whole kit or parts of the kit and the overall complexity were enough for 80% of the tracks. If there are sufficient requests, I'll return with an episode just about Easy Drummer. Compared to my laptop's small external monitor, a new widescreen monitor laid out more of the work at a good magnification and greatly reduced the need for scrolling. A new comfortable chair made sitting at the computer a more pleasant proposition when psyching myself up for yet another session. New monitoring headphones, Biodynamic DT990 Pro, were extremely comfortable for long sessions. The velvet pads didn't squeeze my head or pinch my ears and sounded good. Although open-backed, they didn't have any negative impact on mic recording. New prescription glasses were tailored for each eye and for a screen being at arm's length distance. I really am glad I went to Specsavers. They greatly helped me concentrate on fiddly screen tasks for long periods, and so much better than the cheap reading glasses I'd always used in the past. 
Chapter 7 Editing and Mixing And when is a track finished? Editing was needed to fix occasional timing issues and bad notes. Editing for me is much quicker than re-recording. For the vocal, there are always mouth noises and excessive breath intakes to remove. But these are quick and easy to spot visually in the waveform. And of course vocal tuning, which is the longest editing task of all if you want it to sound natural. Basic mixing ensures that everything I know is there and I want to hear can be heard and it all sounds smooth and balanced relative to each other and fills the frequency spectrum. After any editing mixing session, which has already involved intensive and repeated listening to the bars, sections and the whole song, I'd bounce the result for later close listening on my phone while cooking, out walking or driving or drifting off to sleep. Away from the DAW, without one's eyes watching the waveforms on a screen, it is far more obvious if something needs fixing a timing issue, an instrument or note that was lost or was too loud, a part that was too complex, a part ascending could have been better descending. Other times, something was naggingly wrong but might take several more listens to identify. Of course, one needs to be ever vigilant of the DAW and its thousands of settings. Wow, the number of times I've listened to a song after bouncing to realize I'd left a track muted or soloed. One time I dropped the mouse on the keyboard and didn't have a clue which of the keyboard shortcuts had been activated, and Control z won't necessarily reset them. In general, I would say that by the time the album was released, I had listened to each track at least 100 times from start to end during the mixing process and as changes were made, and each constituent section many more times than that. So if one can remain happy with a song after that amount of concentrated listening, you can be reasonably confident in your work. So when is any track finished? It always crept up on me as a complete surprise. Finishing listening for the umpteenth time and realizing nothing wrong had stood out. Yeehaw! Mind you, everything is relative. I can only fix things that I can detect and only fix it to a level within my skill set. This is where getting and even paying for expert advice really helps. Chapter 8 Getting Real Feedback Before Release Over the years, I had had occasional contact with a husband and wife team who run a local commercial studio. Between them, they have the professional skills of being musos, vocalists, recording engineer, mixing and producing. They were similar in age to me and thus had exposure to similar musical influences it would have been pointless to ask a rap producer to comment. Overall, I paid them for four hours of studio time spread over three sessions, 10 tracks per session. Specifically, I asked whether they could hear any problems in my final bounces. I sat with them in the engineer's room, a fabulous listening environment with excellent monitors, while they listened to each track in full. During and after each track, they would provide specific and general feedback. It's remarkable what trained ears can detect down to specific instruments in the bounced file, e.g. relative volumes, too little or too much compression, EQ boosting notching in frequency ranges, reverb amounts. Sometimes, even though I could still not directly identify the issue myself, by applying their suggested changes, the resulting remix always sounded better. While I had not asked for feedback about the writing, which is a personal taste issue, and I wasn't going to change anything anyway, they were complimentary. Whether just good client relations on their part, it certainly boosted my confidence, as did discovering that my production was not too far off the mark. It's now as good a time as any to use a finished track to illustrate what I've been droning on about. Here's track 26, Shadows, towards the middle, so you can hear the arrangement before I rebuild it for you, element by element. Everything is MIDI, apart from the guitar and vocals. Let's start with double bass. Then add the drum patterns. Here's the tall string guitar. The main vocal. Return to things the way they were. I don't want them to be 
over Then the harmony I'll walk the streets and call your name Come back to me, my lover Step by step, day by day Leave the shadows behind A single support instrument plus extra percussion. Return to things the way they were, they never will be over. I walk the streets and call your name. Where are you now, my lover? If someday you come my way, I'll push those shadows behind. increased intensity towards the finish line. Chapter 9. So when is the album finished, choosing a name, and deciding on the artwork? When I had written about two dozen songs, I wondered when I was going to stop, and when should I stop? As the Beatles were the main influence in my life, there were already emerging strong parallels to their 1968 double album, The Beatles, better known as The White Album, due to its all-white embossed cover. Like mine, it too had hoovered up all their old unfinished work, as well as adding new stuff, was written mostly on acoustic guitar, had a wide range of subject matter, styles and arrangements. Most significantly, it had 30 tracks. I was fortunate enough that more songs kept coming, and although slowing towards the end, I managed to get to the magical 30 mark. I take extra pride in noting that my album is three minutes longer than theirs without having to resort to random throwaway tape loop rubbish like Revolution No. 9. So White Album became an obvious title focus, and aiming for a predominantly white artwork greatly made design options a lot simpler. As I can never resist wordplay, Australia's Flat White Coffee, my favourite drink, was now well known worldwide and it slid into place easily. So The White Album morphed into the Flat White album. Chapter 10, Track Order. Once you've heard a released album several times, you can never imagine a different track order, which would have been better. But making that initial track order decision is really tough. Once made and released, there's no going back. It used to be said that you should start and finish strong, and that the second track and the penultimate track were also very important. How then to maintain listening interest over 30 tracks? And even I can't listen to it all in one solid session. But a few ideas stood out for me. The Sea Bomb was a strong track and meant the most to me, so it took pole position. If listeners didn't like that one, they would be unlikely to like the rest, so I've done them a favour really. There were two other songs about the environment and these were placed at 29 and 30. Two spoken word pieces were separated at tracks 4 and 20. A long orchestral piece was placed in the middle at track 14. And the remaining five instrumentals were scattered, often to provide light relief after a particularly heavy track. While Sunrise and Sunset were placed fifth from the start and fifth from the end to mirror each other. The rest were placed fairly randomly, although care was taken so that a track's ending and the start of the next would never sound too similar in feel, instrumentation, or key. Chapter 11, Long Albums. No production, regardless of its running length or its gestation period, will ever get to be heard until a virtual button is clicked to start digital distribution to the online delivery platforms. In my case, there was a three-year period of writing, demos, then studio recording, arranging, mixing and mastering. If you think the usual 10 to 12 tracks is a long project, then triple that for 30 tracks. Anything could have happened anywhere along the timeline to prevent release, even up to the last five seconds. However, I had a lot of luck, and the DIY approach also has real benefits. 
Apart from the inevitable glitches, the software and hardware kept working. I never fell ill, physically or mentally. Being a retired empty nester, I could write or record any time the mood took me. I didn't have any financial problems. I walked away from a bad motorbike crash with only a few cuts and bruises. The album was released in 2020, just as COVID shook the world to its core. There was absolutely no lost time due to discussion and argument. I had clear focus and intention because there were no other writers, no other performers, no commercial studio and engineer, no interfering producer and no record labels to suck up to. Chapter 12. Why bother? So why do this album at all? With streaming, there has been an increasing trend to non-stop release of singles. But I grew up with albums from great bands and singer-songwriters, the many innovations, the concept albums. But why did I do this album, and a long one at that? Hmm. I had no dreams of being a newly discovered star or being showered with money due to billions of streams. And by the way, both those non-dreams proved 100% correct. The album was made and released just shy of my 70th year, and was likely to be the last notch in my belt of music creativity. So it was packed with every idea I could muster, and much of the motivation and intense focus was to capture some lightning in a bottle, a bottle which will last well past my own life, as long as there is electricity, an internet, and an ability to play or convert MP3s. For an anti-theist like me, that is at least an electronic headstone the equivalent of immortality. So that's it. Okay, so we finished the chapters. For the album, while doing everything myself was a pain, it was offset by many personal triumphs. I've been proud to finish what I started. I remain pleased with the result. And there have been some positive critiques from reviewers beyond family and friends. Being 100% solo also suited my personality. I didn't have to dilute my energies managing other people or worry about money. Relying on others in a commercial environment, if I stuck to my guns about what I wanted, I'd have never finished the album and I would have gone broke. If I compromised, I'd still end up spending a lot of money, but I'd end up with something that didn't match my vision. And that's just assuming everyone is working together pleasantly and with my best interests at heart. Anyway, it all now seems like a fevered dream from which I've shared a few key memories, which I hope were interesting or even helpful. A more detailed making off story, plus the songbook itself, are both available for free via a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks very much to me. The next few guests are already in the can, and I mean already recorded, not you know where. If you have something to say and would like to submit an episode, please send me some brief information via the link in the show notes. Listener comments and feedback are always welcomed, and I'll read out anything particularly relevant or funny. So bye for now, and thanks for listening.